So today we are presenting on the logic of life. This is the first meeting of the Science of Life Club at Stockton University of the spring 2022 semester. The logic of life is the first chapter of the book called Idols of the Mind versus True Reality by Bhakti Madhava Puri. He is the serving director of the Bhaktivedanta Institute of Spiritual Culture and Science in Princeton, New Jersey. The Bhaktivedanta Institute is the organization that uh, implemented this club within Stockton. And the activities of the club go hand in hand with the uh, mission of this institute. It's a 501c3 uh, nonprofit educational organization. And um, if after seeing this presentation, you would like to get in uh, contact with the Institute uh, or the author of the book, you can email Princeton at BVISES.org. This is our serving director. So, animate and inanimate objects. In nature, we observe spontaneously moving animate objects called living objects and inert inanimate objects, lifeless objects which only move when an uh, outside force is applied. So here we can clearly see a clownfish, uh, a living object moving spontaneously due to different desires. Uh, could be playful, it could be looking for food, it could be uh, for mating. So many different desires a living organism has that causes it to move spontaneously. And then we also have rocks on the bottom of the ocean floor that only move when they're right an, an external force is applied to them uh, reductionist science which overemphasizes the importance of microscopic phenomena does not give proper attention to the integral difference between life and matter which is directly observed macroscopically so one of the big uh, critiques of modern science is that it gets lost in its reduction of nature. It's not able to see these um, qualities of life that are so evident to our macroscopic everyday vis uh, vision. Another thing that disappears when you look too closely through a microscope and you don't focus on the big picture is cognition. All of a sudden things just become complex atoms and molecules bumping into each other instead of a cell a living organism cognizant and also uh, moving in an environment based on desire and cognition. Not giving proper attention to the difference between life and matter leads to problems with discerning the integral difference between living and mechanical systems. This leads to issues with honestly assessing the capacity of artificial intelligence, among other problems. So this is a mechanical system, a little toy fish, right? Just like any other inanimate object, um, machines only operate when an external cogn uh, cognizant entity initiates them. So you see a, a finger putting this toy fish in the water on the top video. And then on the bottom, you see that the fish, the, the robot fish, the toy fish, keeps on moving forward until it hits the side of the bowl. And then it just continues to move down the uh, surface of the bowl. So there is no cognition in inanimate objects or mechanical systems inherent to the system itself. It's just going based on the momentum of the force that enabled it to move. So uh, as far as artificial intelligence goes, um, we just had a conference, the, the Bhaktivedanta Institute just had a conference on December 30th and 31st um, about the difference between artificial and natural intelligence. Because artificial intelligence is purely syntactical, just like any other mechanical system, it's based on the input, it's just following commands. Uh, it's like computational decision making. Um, it can't do anything novel. There's no spontaneity um, within this artificial intelligence. So it's actually not properly termed intelligence because intelligence implies understanding. Understanding implies the capacity to 
consider moral and ethical issues uh, to be able to connect to another living being. Um, so artificial intelligence cannot understand. All it can do is compute decisions based on the data it's been given. So you can uh, learn more about that if you like by checking out the um, Science and Scientist Conference from 2021. Um, difference between natural and artificial intelligence. I can give the link later on. So, uh, uh, Nidia, at any point, if you have a question or any comment, please just uh, jump in. So, what animates living objects slash entities? Is it chemical reactions? Chemical reactions generally produce a stable product, such as an acid and an alkali producing a neutral salt. However, these chemical reactions are not self-perpetuating over the course of many years. Within living entities, biological systems, uh, there exist special kinds of chemical reactions that are sustained for great lengths of time. This is known as biological activity, which can become very intricate and thus defy explanation at merely a chemical level. So, you know, one instance of this, again, is desire of a living being. When, uh, you know, when you reach for the snack in front of you, you're not, your body isn't moving because chemical reactions are going on inside of you. That's not the cause. The cause is you have a desire to eat. And then you reach your hand. The desire, the cognition is what's directing the matter. Actuality and potentiality. Aristotle called the inanimate inert matter dunamis, it's a Greek word, meaning potentiality, and referred to actuality as energia. Energia, or energy, is defined by scientists as the ability to do work. But what force compels the inanimate to animate, the potential to actualize? Aristotle called this entelechy from teleos, meaning end, purpose, or goal also referred to as teleology. Specifically, this is internal teleology as opposed to external teleology. Internal teleology means um, intrinsic or natural purpose. So this is more on internal teleology. The inherent unity of reality, the organic whole, is manifest within the parts or participants of reality as their purpose or final end. The purpose which they serve within the organic whole is the reason for their existence. Genuine fulfillment of the participant is only experienced when the potential of this purposeful relationship is realized and then actually pursued. We'll talk more about this at the end. So briefly, we just explained external teleology. Um, when a carpenter decides to build a chair out of wood, the external purpose or teleology of the wood becomes the chair. The inert material of dead wood has the potential to become a chair. This potential is actualized through the cognition of the labor of the carpenter. Any artifact can be viewed from the perspective of external or outer teleology. We also here uh, show the four causes. Aristotle um, gave us these four causes, which we can use to understand uh, different concepts. So the material cause of the chair is wood. The material, the matter it's made out of. The efficient cause is the carpenter. The efficient cause is uh, that entity which affects the, the matter, the material wood. It affects the wood to become the, the final product. So the carpenter is the one building the chair. The formal cause, meaning the form. What is the form of the chair? How is that coming? Right. The wood turns into the chair, but where did that form come from before it manifested externally as a chair? So that's the concept of the chair, the idea of the carpenter. And then finally, the final cause, which is what teleology refers to. Teleology refers to the final cause. And specifically, this is external cause, uh, external teleology. So the external uh, cause of the wood 
is the utility of the chair. You want to sit down somewhere. So you get some wood and you build the chair. The reason for the exit, the reason for the chair's existence, your desire to sit down, is the cause for the transformation of the wood. So uh, an important idea, which will play a role as we continue, is that the cause for the existence of something is the final end which it serves. The final end of the wood, uh, the, the final end of the chair is the desire to sit. So that's actually the uh, reason for its existence. And again, this is just external teleology. So it gets a little bit deeper when we're talking about internal teleology. When we're talking about the internal reason of life, of a human being, what is the reason or purpose of life? That reason will be the cause of the existence of living organisms. So now we'll go more into this dunamis, which means potentiality, energia, which is actuality, and entelechy, which is the process of actualization. This is a quote from Aristotle's Metaphysics. There is a science which studies being quo being and the properties inherent in it, virtue of its nature. This science is not the same as any of the so-called particular sciences, for none of the others contemplates being generally quo being. They divide off some portion of it and study the attribute of this portion, as do, for example, the mathematical sciences. But since it is for the first principles and the most ultimate causes that we are searching, clearly they must belong to something in virtue of its own nature. The term being is used in various senses, but with reference to one central idea and one definite characteristic, and not as merely a common epithet. Thus, as the term healthy always relates to health, either as preserving it or producing it, or as indicating it or as receptive of it, and as medical relates to the art of medicine, either as possessing it or as naturally adopting it, or as being a function of medicine, then we shall find other terms used similarly to these. So being is used in various senses, but always with reference to one principle. For some things are said to be because they are substances, others because they are modifications of substance, others because they are a process towards substance or destructions or privations or qualities of substance, or productive or generative of substance, or terms relating to substance, or negations of certain of these terms or of substance. So the purpose for including this is basically to show that Aristotle's idea uh, when he lived, you know, almost 2,500 years ago in Greece, his idea was that there are different types of being. There are different types of matter. It's not just matter. It's not just one substance. It's differentiated. So according to Aristotle, there are many different, although not necessarily equivalent, kinds of being or matter. The dunamis. Uh, where potentiality exhibits various potencies depending on the inner nature of that which it is the potential of. For example, the seed of a tree and the egg of a chicken actualize as different organisms based on the inherent nature of the particular kind of living entity. Within modern science, the study of genetics validates the brilliance of Aristotle, who again lived in ancient times. So. Uh, the fact that he could conceive of this through his methods of observation and and his capacity to uh, rationally develop conceptions, uh, you know, it's quite brilliant on his part. So here in genetics, we can understand that genes, so basically this is going to describe that um, This is describing, what is this describing? Yes, that the genetic information determines the material of the organism, right? So the uh, physical composition of the fish and, and scales and the physical composition of a bird and feathers 
that development occurs because of the the matter, the DNA, the information. So these are just giving some uh, you know definitions that genes are units of hereditary information and they carry instructions for building proteins. These genes that are encoded within these proteins are what enable cells to function. Most organisms that reproduce sexually have two copies of each gene because each parent cell or organism donates a single copy of its genes to its offspring. Additionally, genes can exist in the slightly different forms called alleles, which further adds to genetic variation. The combination of alleles of a gene that an individual receives from both parents determines what biologists call the genotype for a particular trait, such as hair or texture, a hair texture. The genotype that an individual possesses for a trait in turn determines the phenotype, the observable characteristics, such as whether the individual actually ends up with straight, wavy, or curly hair. Species in biology classification comprising uh, related organisms, so this is defining a species, uh, comprising related organisms that share common characteristics and are capable of interbreeding. The genetic species concept, which considers all organisms capable of inheriting traits from one another, within a common gene pool and the amount of genetic difference between populations of that species. So just to go back and uh, clarify what we're doing here, Aristotle said that there are different kinds of matter and that this the potency inside that, so matter, again, we're saying uh, matter is dunamis, is potentiality. So this, dormant potential has within it certain potencies that direct the conclusion of its actualization. So those dormant potencies in the matter, uh, you know, it's, it's an organized process that unfolds in a rational way. And so this is Aristotle's idea 2,500 years ago, and it's essentially uh, confirmed by modern genetics because we're saying that phenotypes, right, the observable traits of members of a species, they are the result of the genotype, what is going on in the DNA. So hopefully that's clear. Um, now, um, Bhakti Madhava Pori Maharaj, uh, the author of this book elaborates of course, modern science has not discovered what corresponds to entelechy, the mysterious force that causes a particular glob of protoplasm to differentiate and almost magically develop into whatever life form it eventually becomes. It is too much complex and specific to be understood as the result of a series of standard chemical reactions. Various experiments have been done on the zygote, a fertilized egg, to show that there is a definite directive process involved that continues despite severe modification of the basic structure at an early stage of development. So the reference that um, Sripad Bhakti Madhava Pori Maharaj referred to was this, uh, an experiment where the, the cells of an egg, of a frog egg, uh, it was experimentally separated into two and the result was uh, instead of just stopping the process of the development it just created two <laughs> two tadpoles um, so the directive process wasn't hurt by the experiment of trying to you know interfere with the process the the internal process the internal um, you know, the determine the self-determination of the process of the development of life from an embryo to a mature organism or a semi-mature organism, you know, that process uh, is being carried on in a, in a very determined way. So, so, the reason that we're talking about this, uh, as far as relating back to religion and spirituality, is uh, talking about the soul as that directive process. What is it that um, actualizes matter? 
that actualizes potential into the actual, we're saying that is the soul. Um, so now this is a just a scientific paper that talks more about uh, self-organization. It's talking about the internal determination of life to mature self. Uh, this was in the journal uh, Stem Cell Reports. You can look it up here if you want. Embryonic development has been traditionally seen as an inductive process directed by exogenous material inputs and extra embryonic signals. Increasing evidence, however, is showing that in addition to exogenous signals, the development of the embryo involves endogenous self-organization. Recently, the self-organizing potential has been highlighted by a number of stem cell models known as embryoids that can recapitulate different aspects of embryogenesis in vitro. Here we review the self-organizing behaviors observed in different embryoid models and seek to reconcile this new evidence with classical knowledge of developmental biology. This analysis leads to re-examine embryonic development as a guided self-organizing process where patterning and morphogenesis are controlled by a combination of exogenous signals and endogenous self-organization. Finally, we discuss the multidisciplinary approach required to investigate the genetic and cellular basis of self-organization. It is almost as if there were an invisible pattern, concept, or idea that was imprinted on the specific type of matter that directed it toward the development into the specific creature that it becomes. Aristotle considered the situation from this point of view and concluded that there is a soul that is responsible for this. A couple of thousand years later, GWF Hegel also demonstrated his, uh, in his Science of Life that there is a concept involved in the determination of its corresponding content. And between these two towering figures of philosophy, Immanuel Kant also developed a similar theme he called nature's work and his philosophical analysis of the scientific understanding of organisms. Again, this is a part of uh, a quote from the book, Idols of the Mind, by our serving director, Sripad Bhakti Madhavapuri Maharaj. Here at the bottom, we just have a photo of Aristotle, who, you know, was an ancient Greek philosopher, Immanuel Kant, who uh, was around maybe 300 years ago, and then about 50 years later, G.W.F. Hegel. Uh, they're both German philosophers. So now, um, you mentioned in the last slide how Hegel develops this idea in his Science of Logic, in his book called The Science of Logic. So this, um, what we present now is uh, in line with what Hegel, Hegel presented in his Science of Logic. So we'll be talking about mechanical objects and systems. Objects that lack internal relatedness may possess merely external relatedness. Planets relate to each other externally, as in the solar system, explicable by the laws of gravity and motion. Newtonian gravity depends upon mass, but the internal composition of that mass does not play any role in determining their attraction to other planets. Thus, gravity acts in a purely external way to unite the planets as a solar system moving around the sun. Mechanics views as a system, uh, mechanics views a system as having separable independent parts that possess a fixed identity outside their connection with the system of which they are parts. If the isolated parts of a system retain the same identity as when they, uh, as when they are connected within, it is called a mechanical system. Um, so let me just summarize this. So basically, when you have a clock, you have, just to be simple, we say a bunch of gears. The gears have a static identity, whether they're apart from the clock or in the clock. It's not that when the gears are put together to make a clock, the gears themselves transform. They're still the same gears. They're just uh, serving like a collective purpose, but they retain the same identity as a gear. It doesn't change. 
And that's different from what we're about to talk about as a chemical system. Do you have any comments or anything, Lydia? No, I'm good so far, thank you. So chemical objects and systems. Chemical objects have parts that are internally related. They are not the same when isolated from each other as when they are connected or united with each other. So to demonstrate that, we can see, you know, chlorine and sodium are two elements. They have their own identity as elements, whether or not they're a part, uh, you know, united as salt. However, when they are united as salt, they completely change. It's not that it's still sodium and chlorine as they existed independently. They completely transform. That's why it's a reaction, a chemical reaction. Chlorine and sodium completely transform, and now it's a whole new substance called salt. So this is different from the clock because the, the gears still were gears inside the clock. They were just doing something different. Here, the chlorine and sodium ions are completely changing. They're a whole new substance. Salt is different than sodium and chlorine. So external relations are formed due to the intrinsic properties of the individual parts of a chemical reaction. So with the mechanical systems, the reason for coming together uh, is an external force, right? You have, someone has to come and externally construct the clock out of gears, taking the gears and putting them together. But uh, with a chemical system, the internal potency of a sodium ion attracts to chlorine based on their internal composition. So we have their molecular structures here. And you can see the electron jumping over to the chlorine. And that's, that's, the, that's symbolic of the relationship, the internal attraction that these two identities have, forming a whole new identity when they unite. The individual characteristics of a chemical object, such as being basic or acidic, is relative to the characteristics of what it is being compared to. So this is another layer of uh, the identity of these chemical objects. Uh, an acid is not just, you know, having some absolute identity as an acid. An acid is only acidic when compared to something more basic than it. Um, so for instance, in this picture, we have some liquid that's pH seven and some liquid that's a pH 4. So pH 4 is acidic when compared to pH 7, but when compared to a pH 1, you know, pH 4 is actually basic. So it's relative, the identity of, uh, your, the identity as a, the layer of identity as acidic or alkaline is relative. But with mechanical systems, again, uh, it's purely external and it's not relative to uh, anything outside of it. It's just a static object. Generally, generally speaking. Because of course we can say you take a gear and you put it in fire and it melts, but you know, that's not a normal circumstance. That's a, you know, an extreme circumstance. So the relationship of mechanical objects to other objects within a mechanical system is created by external law, whereas the relationship of chemical objects to other objects within a chemical system is due to the inherent nature of each individual chemical object and the natural interaction of such objects based on these properties. The parts of a clock retain the same identity whether or not they are united as a clock. The parts of a chemical system have a distinctive and separate identity when they are isolated from each other, such as individual sodium and chlorine ions, while also forming a new distinctive identity as salt when they are united. Salt, sodium, and chlorine all have unique identities. They each may exist independently in an isolated state while also existing dependently as elemental constituents of a final chemical compound. So now uh, we are moving on to biological systems. 
So it's important to try to be aware of the development going on here where um, the, as far as the development of the identity of the parts in connection to the whole. So the identity of the parts within a mechanical system um, are just static, whether or not they're inside the chemical, uh, inside the mechanical system or not. The identity of the mechanical object is uh, the same when it's in or outside of the whole. In a chemical system, it's different. Um, it does have an external, it, it does have a, its own identity, just like the mechanical object does before it's in the system. But once it enters into the chemical system, it, its identity completely transforms. So now we're moving on to biological systems. So now the part of the biological system does not have any identity outside of the whole. So hopefully you can see that progression and we'll talk more about the biological system. Those parts that cannot be separated from a system without destroying it as a working system can no longer be called parts, but are participants uh, or members of a dynamic whole. The participants are as essential to the whole as the whole is to the participants. This is the biological system or organism. Here we are removed from the stasis of fixed objects and are in the milieu of pure dynamical activity. Participants cannot be isolated from the whole in which they are participants and remain what they are. A DNA molecule can no more be what it is as a producer of protein molecules than the protein molecules can be what they are as produced from the action of DNA and producing the DNA. Each participant is the cause and effect of each other. Um, and this is how Kant defined an organism, Immanuel Kant. Uh, we mentioned him before. Uh, therefore, nothing in an organism is without purpose, nor is the organism as a whole without purpose in the environment. Thus, everything in the organism is both purpose, the ends, and the means. So we can understand that a heart, you know, let's say a heart is a part of the biological system. But the part wasn't added. It, it didn't, it's not like the heart existed outside of the biological system and then it was added into it. The whole of a biological system, it develops together. The whole grows from an embryo to a mature organism and all the parts are growing along with it. And their identity is 100% dependent upon the whole, you know, if you take a heart out of the body, then it's no longer, it doesn't no longer functions at all. Uh, and it doesn't, so it hurts both the, the part as it just, it's useless. And also the rest of the body is, you know, as a whole is very much affected. So it's a very intimate connection within a biological system. Aristotle uh, even said, you know, if you cut off a hand from the body, it's not a hand at all anymore because hand is more associated with its function within the whole. And if you cut it off, then it's not a hand at all. It's just some dead inert matter. So <clears throat> um, we mentioned here that a DNA molecule uh, can no more be what it is as a producer of protein molecules than the protein molecules can be what they are as produced from the action of DNA and producing the DNA. So this is, you know, a very interesting um, point to, to become aware of that it's not just linear causality within this dynamic biological system. Uh, it's not just that, you know, DNA causes protein, you know, like the gears cause the clock. Both the DNA and the protein are both involved with each other's ca causality. Um, so here we find some uh, description of, of what we mean by that. So essentially here, we're just describing how DNA 
causes protein. In the first step, the information in DNA is transferred to a messenger RNA uh, molecule by way of process called transcription. During transcription, the DNA of a gene serves as a uh, template for complementary base pairing and an enzyme called RNA polymer 2 catalyzes the formation of pre-RNA, uh, mRNA molecule, which is then processed to form mature mRNA. The resulting mRNA is a single-stranded copy of the gene, which next must be translated into a protein molecule. So we're just showing that DNA causes the protein. Now here we're showing that protein actually causes the DNA. <laughs> And you can check out the references if you want there uh, at the bottom of both of the slides. Uh, DNA replication involves an incredibly sophisticated, highly coordinated series of molecular events. These events are divided into four major stages, initiation, unwinding, primer synthesis, and elongation. During initiation, so-called interior proteins bind the replication origin, a base pair sequence of nucleotides known as ORIC. This binding triggers events that unwind the DNA double helix into two single-stranded DNA molecules. Uh, several groups of proteins are involved in this unwinding. Primer synthesis marks the beginning of the actual synthesis of the new DNA molecule. Primers are short stretches of nucleotides, about 10 to 12 bases in length, synthesized by an RNA polymer enzyme called primase. Primers are required because DNA polymers, the enzymes responsible for the actual addition of nucleotides to the DNA strand, can only add deoxyribonucleotides to the 3OH group of an existing chain and cannot begin synthesizing de novo. Primase, on the other hand, can add ribonucleotides de novo. Later, after elongation is complete, the primer is removed and replaced with DNA molecules. So this is not linear, not just cause and effect in a, in a unidirectional, single direction. It's, it's both ways, it's going both ways, causality is happening both ways. So when there is this kind of contradictory idea, um, this is called dialectic. The, the way we can understand rationally what appears to be contradiction, that is dialectic. Sorry to interrupt, but I have to head out. I left a message in the chat, but thank you for a great first meeting. You have to head out. Do you, do you have another 10 minutes? We can wrap up. Um, I have, I, I could do another two minutes if that works. Another two minutes, okay. So did you have any questions based on what we talked about so far? I mean, we can find, uh, close with that. No, actually, I don't have any questions right now. This must be pretty new, some of this stuff, no? It is pretty new. Um, I've just been kind of listening and taking it all in, though. Um, I was going to reflect on everything that you said, and hopefully I'd have some questions by the time of the next meeting. Okay. Um, so basically this last part of the presentation was uh, just showing this dialectic reason that uh, is so inherent to life. We'll, we'll just basically close with this last quote, I guess. Uh, so abstract understanding tends to think of either a unity or a multiplicity. Pure multiplicity is indicative of the atomic thinking of material reductionism. Pure unity is the indeterminateness of abstract monism. Unity in multiplicity is the comprehensive thinking of dialectic reason. Life has to be comprehended as a process in which its participants are simultaneously both the ends, uh, products, and the production of one another. So this idea of dialectic causality is something which, you know, doesn't exist essentially in uh, modern science, but we can see where it is naturally observed uh, as just we described between DNA and protein. Essentially, the, the take home lesson about, not, not lesson, but what we hope to communicate about um, the relationship between parts and whole, between machines, machi mechanical thinking, chemical thinking, and then dialectic reason in the biological system, is that it's necessary to inquire about the whole before we can study the parts. Right now, science just goes right to the parts, and they think they can understand the whole by studying the parts in isolation and then putting them together. But that doesn't make any sense because you don't know what they're parts of 
So the, the Indic parable of the seven blind men and the elephant, they each try to feel the parts of the elephant and then put their uh, isolated empirical observations together and you get the image on the right. They didn't know it was an elephant beforehand. So one thought they felt the cobra, it was the trunk, the ears uh, they thought were fans, they thought the body was a brick wall. And they put together this image of some weird thing. But if they knew the whole first, they could understand it's an elephant. And then they'll be able to adequately study the parts. So our humble wish is that we can talk about this idea of understanding the whole first and then studying the parts because text without context is pretext. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Namaste.